Dear ladies and gentlemen, I'm especially happy to welcome all of you to this very special meeting. Not just one of our usual fellows brunches or fellows lunches, but the lecture of our presidential visiting fellow, Professor Dr. Chaim Weiss from Ben Gurion University, Beersheba, Israel. First and foremost, I would like to greet our university's president, Professor Dr. Udo Hebel, and say a special in bold letters. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the many different signs of your generosity and for making Chaim's uh, stay in Regensburg and this lecture possible. I am not the only one here in this room uh, who is very happy about this. A special welcome also to our Vice President, Professor Dr. Ursula Regener. A welcome to our many colleagues, fellows, guests, following this lecture. Before I give the words to our president, Professor Hebel, I would like to say a few words about Chaim Weiss. Chaim Weiss, who did most of his studies at Hebrew University of Jerusalem, is currently professor at the Department of Hebrew Literature at Ben-Gurion University of the Negev, Beersheba, Israel. At the same time, he has been connected to the Beyond Canon project from the very beginning. He's an outstanding expert on the rabbinic writings, but he's also working with modern Hebrew literature. What I like very much, he never treats ancient writings as something which belongs to the past only. Instead, he is able to show the liveliness, the many literary qualities, and even the humor to be found in these writings. His questions are never just related to the past, but show that telling these stories confront us with our ideas of the world today. He did not just publish a wonderful new monograph on old age in rabbinic literature. When near becomes far, aging in rabbinic literature together with Mira Barberg, Oxford, 2020. He is not only able uh, to demonstrate how close modern images uh, of the ancient Jewish hero Bar Kusiba or Bar Kokhba or to Hermann the German or better Armin der Keruska. He is a wonderful teacher, listener and storyteller. And I will never forget the session when the students after I don't know how many hours simply wanted to go on and go on reading and studying text with him. Chaim is a highly courageous peace activist and intellectual in the truest sense of the word. We are happy to have the chance to meet you again in these days. A wonderful scholar, a great teacher, and what is most important, a friend. I would like to give the word to uh, Professor Hebel. Thank you, uh, Professor Niklas. Uh, thank you, Tobias, for giving me the chance to address you. Um, I promise to um, be brief uh, because after this introduction, I fully understand that uh, the last thing you now would like to hear are words from the president, but you would like to hear Heim Weiss uh, speaking <laughs> and uh, talking about what uh, Tobias Niklas has introduced. Um, welcome all of you to this very special meeting here this morning, Vice President Regner, Dean Buchinger, dear colleagues, friends, international guests. Uh, um, the Presidential Visiting Fellowship uh, is a very special um, fellowship which we introduced a few years um, to give our various schools the opportunity to invite particularly important um, persons and also old friends and, and uh, scholarly comrades. And uh, we have had uh, wonderful people from all over the world, from the US, from European countries. And um, I think um, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity to bring you back to Regensburgheim. I know you've been here before many times, uh, tied in with uh, the Beyond Canon project of which the whole University is very proud. Um, um, this is a, a wonderful project, so full of uh, intellectual richness, um, um, vivid scholarship, and international cooperation. So many, many things which are dear to our hearts come together uh, in this uh, Beyond uh, Canon project. Um, which uh, has a wonderful history until it uh, came into this world. And ever since it's been in the world has had a wonderful progress. And I know that a lot of promises uh, in the air. Um, 
Um, we, we talked about many things last night uh, at the meeting, Heim and, and uh, Tobias, and uh, um, I'm, I'm very sure that uh, many things will emerge uh, from this uh, 20 uh, 21 uh, Presidential Visiting Fellowship, uh, particularly in regard to our new relationship between University of Regensburg and Ben Gurion University of the Negev. Uh, when I was in Israel two years ago, um, we signed uh, the agreement Heim in, in Tel Aviv, and uh, we had many plans for a delegation of University of Regensburg yeah. to go uh, to Israel and to spend um, the larger chunk of that visit uh, uh, at your university. Then the pandemic came and many things had to be uh, put on hold, um, but uh, as I insist to say, it's only put on hold, uh, on temporary hold, and, and we will uh, uh, make this visit um, uh, real um, whenever it will be possible at, at the earliest notice, because uh, we have decided to uh, uh, enlarge our um, scholarly relationship and personal friendships with colleagues in Israel and specific, specific so uh, at Ben Gurion uh, University, where there are so many corresponding interests, uh, be it in area studies, be it in particular fields, uh, be it in sustainability, and, and many, many, many things uh, that uh, uh, we can here at the University of Regensburg uh, um, learn uh, from your university and also from um, uh, individual uh, talents and scholarship performed there. So, um, welcome, um, um, Heim. Um, I was uh, uh, Tobias mentioned Herman the German. It was uh, wonderful to see last night how you can uh, span a bridge uh, from your scholarship in the field you are doing uh, to the scholarship I used to do in, in pre-presidential times when there was uh, time for genuine personal scholarship. And uh, um, uh, it's, it's this, this wonderful coincidence that Heim is working in uh, um, origin studies, foundational uh, identity studies, um, which is also something I worked on. And I came across this uh, Herman the German monument in the middle of Minnesota, um, uh, where you have an exact replica of the Hermann der Schiruska Denkmal in Teutoburger Wald uh, erected um, in the upper Midwest in Minnesota, which in terms of landscape is completely not what the Teutoburger Wald is like. Um, but uh, there in the middle you have of the 1880s, uh, you have this Hermann the German uh, monument uh, erected by immigrants who wanted to preserve their German identity by putting up a monument, uh, uh, which um, we, we talked about uh, last night. So if anybody wondered about uh, this uh, curious um, uh, compound construction of Hermann the German. But this is not what this lecture uh, will um, uh, mainly be about time. I, yeah. I will try to stay as long as possible to uh, listen to you, but then I apologize for not being able to stay until the end. And uh, to give you all a taste um, what an in-person, on-site um, event uh, can be like in Regensburg, I've uh, begun a few months ago to have as my screen background uh, a picture of the Audi Max. Uh, so uh, as a kind of uh, metaphorical or metonymical, depending uh, on, on how you define it, uh, glimpse into the still real world of a university in presencia, uh, to which I hope we uh, can and will return um, in a few uh, weeks. And then Heim, uh, next time you come by and you come to Regensburg, uh, we will have an on-site, in-presence um, um, event. Um, and um, we will um, again uh, shake hands and talk person to person without looking into uh, uh, screens. But I'm very happy that we have these digital opportunities uh, to keep up uh, the work and uh, to keep us connected um, um, and also to preserve and uh, enlarge our friendships. Uh, in, in this um, spirit, um, all the best to you, Heim. Thank you very much uh, for coming, for taking the time, for sharing your scholarship uh, with us here in Regensburg. And I'm very much looking forward to further meetings um, in, in your uh, neck of the woods and also uh, here in Regensburg. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. So now my turn, right? Yes. Okay, so I'm, I'm very excited. I'm excited about the whole trip to Regensburg and to see everybody here because it's not really on Zoom because we are sitting 
at the same build. Most some of us sitting the, at the same building, just in different rooms. So it's kind of I don't know hybrid more than a Zoom meeting. And I got the, the, the opportunity to meet so many of you face to face here. So it was a very successful trip, and I'm really excited. Um, and um, I apologize. I've, I will read the entire lecture because I'm not my English is okay, but I can only speak without paper in Hebrew. So I'll do it from, I'll read it. So I'd like to thank the University of Regensburg for inviting me here uh, in these difficult and strange, very strange times. I'd like to thank the, my dear friends, the president of the university, Professor Dr. Udo Hebel, Professor Dr. Tobias Niklas, and Dr. Stephanie Hallinger, and all my dear friends, I, I would not mention everybody by, by name. I see Sabina here, Michal, Ute, Harold, and everybody else, Andres, Jens, and, uh, and, and all the members of the Beyond Canon Research Center for their wonderful hospitality. This center has become a second home to me over the last uh, couple of years, and not just in the academic sense. I've I have so many friends here who have who have missed dearly in this long a long and tiring COVID times. We had few Zoom meetings, but uh, so I'm very happy to return to Regensburg and to enjoy the university's warmth and generosity. It's really great to be here. I don't know if you, I'm expressing it uh, fully, but it's I'm really happy to be here. My talk today would focus though briefly, on the complicated juncture between history and literature. I'm interested in how literature narrates historical events and in the political, cultural, and theological perspectives that literature uh, construction, constructions reveal. For example, how did the sages who wrote the Mishnah and the Talmud in the first centuries CE process into literary text such, such a complex and difficult historical experience as the destruction of the temple in the year 70 CE. Anyone, anyone acquainted with rabbinic literature, literature knows that it is hard to find in it any answer to such specific historical questions as how many Roman soldiers participate in the first Jewish Roman war or how how was the Roman army organized? What kind of weapons did they use? Or where did they, they attack from? Such, such historical questions hardly concern the sages. The historical issues that do get processed into literary text are all, theolo are all theological by nature. Why did God decide to destroy the temple? What did the Jewish people or the Jewish or Jewish society do to deserve such destruction. The sages view history as a manifestation of God's will, and this makes such technical issues as the organization of the Roman army almost irrelevant. Entirely beside the point, for the sages, the Roman army is nothing but an agent of God's will in the world, and therefore, the, rele the relevant historical and literary issue is not what have the Roman ever done for us, but rather but what does God want? Naturally, this unique literary historical uh, worldview of the sages has been extensively studied. So I will not consider it further here. What interests me and what I will focus on today is the way that further generation, or in our case, very late ones, in the 19th and early 20th century, took this same literary historical perspective and adopted it for their, the benefit of modern readers. In other words, I will examine how Talmudic stories, which were written in the first century CE, the Talmud mainly in the third to sixth centuries, were Re, uh, readopted with the rise of European nationalism and the foundation of the Zionist movement in order to fit the sh shifting contemporary political and cultural requirements of uh, or preferences. One of the most popular literary tools used by Hebrew culture in the process of adopting historical works for modern uh, concerns is the literary anthology. 
Literary anthologies collected ancient and medieval traditions, translating, arranging, and adapting them for the modern Hebrew reader or worldview and values. As noted by historian Israel Bartal, anthologies were highly instrumental in the Hebrew culture of the 19th and early 20th centuries for enlisting the past for the creation and foundation of modern national culture. They were vast literary enterprises operating under the influence of European Enlightenment in the, an attempt to recreate its history for the revival of the Jewish nation. Thus, they would exclude uh, undesirable elements and highlight those texts which confirm, confirmed to the worldview and uh, preferences of the rising Jewish nationalist movement. Of all the various anthologies of rabbinic literature that were produced and printed at the time, I would like to focus on the most famous one, Sefer Agada, the Book of Legends. This is the book. I would have brought the English version as well, but then I had to pay for overweight at the flight. So it's a very thick and heavy book, as you can see. It was translated to many languages, including Yiddish. It was authored and edited in Odessa, in the first decade of the 20th century by the renewed poet Chaim Nachman Bialik, recognized in his own life as the national poet, and the influential literary editor Yoshua Khan Ravnitsky. As Tzafi Zebal Ran shown, Bialik and Ravnitsky were, were facing two challenges, the one more practical in nature and the other more fundamental. Practically, they were worried that the ancient Talmud Talmudic stories might be forgotten, as they were not easily accessible. The stories were scattered without rhyme rhyme or reason throughout rabbinic literature. They were not arranged by subject or by any other organizing principle. And if you, want, you wanted to read them, you had to borrow into ancient literature, which in, in many cases was also written in Aramaic. Thus, Bialik wrote in the, in the methodological essay which prefaced the collection's publishing. You have it in Hebrew and in English. I'll read it in English. These days, not everyone is versed in ancient books, nor is everybody able to will or willing to dig under mountains piled up over generations in hopes of finding some precious stone underneath. Much less can everyone sew together tethers and patches into whole praying show, or construct a building from broken stones strewn around. So a contem contemporary accustomed to seeking order, harmony, and a potential a completeness in his studies, upon entering these desolate woods would be unable to make heads or tails from it, his toil ever exceeding his reward. That's Bialik. Consequently, Bialik and Ravnitsky saw themselves as archivists, tasked with uh, sorting and arranging their materials, and then serving them to readers translated into Hebrew and ordered into section and subject and index as well with keywords. The second, more fundamental issue which led to the pub pub production and publication of Sefer Agadah was their fear that in a, secularizing, in, in a secularizing and nationalizing Jewish society, rabbinic literature would be made irrelevant and worthless, or worse, became a representation of a past that one wishes to, bur to bury and forget, to replace with a new image of the new Jew, for whom the rabbinic literature represents the diasporic past. Working against that, they aim to dress rabbinic literature in new garbs, more fitting to the era, and then also underscore its enduring relevance for the formation of a national identity. It should be noted that when Sefer Agada, the Book of Legend, was published first in the in a shorter edition in 1908, and then in its almost complete form in 1911, it was received with great enthusiasm exceeding anything its editors could have hoped for. Subsequent edit editions were printed one after another, 
making Sefer Agada a bestseller in Hebrew-speaking Jewish world of the time. For all intents and purposes, Sefer Agada replaced rabbinic literature for the modern Hebrew reader. Paradoxically, contributing to its disappearance, for the very existence of Sefer Agada made it almost unnecessary to refer to, to, to the original texts. One had no need now to open the Talmud in order to read rabbinic literature, for Bialik and Ravnitsky had already done it for us, and then put it, it in, into easier, more accessible Hebrew. There are multiple examples for scholars, authors, poets, refer, referencing what they thought was Talmudic source, but was actually Sefer Agada version of it. This fact is consequential in as much as Sefer Agada is not a simple intermediary. The editorial, the editorial acts of sorting and categorizing it, it, its content reflects a political, cultural, and theological agenda. On the one hand, Bialik and Ravnitsky wanted to create the impression that they are just translators, handing to the readers the sources as they, they, as they were. But on the other hand, they wanted to adapt rabbinic literature to what they called the spirit of the people, and therefore allowed themselves to, to as they declare in a very rare occasions, and I quote now from the preface of Seth Agada, they allow themselves to omit an expression too offensive to contemporary readers' sense of modesty, an omission which would be marked by three consecutive lines. Now I can tell you, if you see three consecutive lines in Sefer Agada, you should run to the Talmud and find the source because usually there's something very juicy that they, they took out. Okay? And indeed, Sefer Agada contains very few instances of those three consecutive lines which mark obvious reductions. This gives the impression the editors wanted to create that they did not frequently interfere with their sources, except that this impression is wrong, very, very wrong. Bialik and Ravnitsi created an open and flexible editorial space omitting, changing, and substituting lines in hundreds of sources without marking, marking such changes or noting anyone at all about them. Indeed, the overt editing serves as a kind of cover or camouflage for an extensive radical editing work unmarked in, as such in the, in the text for, of materials they deemed unsuitable. Thus, sexually, sexually explicit material, excessive references to magic and uh, magical practices and witchcraft, or representations of popular practices that the editors considered shameful or offensive were all taken care of. They were either removed altogether from the anthology, marginalized within it, or uh, revised and rewritten. Thus, in the second part of this talk, I would like to demonstrate the power of this editorial work by reading a short Talmudic text and comparing it with its version of In Sefer Agada. Bialik and Ravnitsky version omit just one line, only one line, but this small omission turns the story on its head, con concealing what the editors probably thought of as undesirable element. The example I would focus on is taken from the cycle of tall tales about Rabbi Barbar Khanna. A Babylonian sage of the third century CE, Rabbi Barbar Khanna belonged to a small con company of scholars who made dangerous voyages on foot between Jewish center in Babylonia and the center in the land of Israel. Their job was to maintain the connection between those two centers by uh, transporting knowledge and scholarly and legal traditions back and forth. Apart from the intellectual knowledge Rabbi Barbar Khanna conveyed, the Babylonian Talmud preserved a long and beautiful sequence of tales uh, recounting his travels in the wild, wilder regions between Babylon, Babel, Babylonia and the land of Israel. These stories reveal Rabbi Barbar Khanna as a capable storyteller who frequently employ, employs fan, fantastical elements in his tales.
As noted by Dina Stein, who studied these tales, the foreign wilderness wherein these stories take place allow a crossing of historical and cultural boundaries, permitting encounters with mythical creatures and characters from the ancient Jewish history. Towards the end of this section, there are mentions of some uh, desert voyages, which he took with in the company of a pre-Islamic Arab scout and guide. I will now read a small excerpt from these accounts, which Rav Barbachana gives in first person. So I'll read it in English. That Arab also said to me, come and I will show you the Israelites who died during the 40 years wandering in the wilderness. I went with him and saw them. They appeared to be in a state of exhilaration, lay, lying on their backs. The knee of one of them was raised up and the Arab passed under that knee, riding his camel and holding his fear erect without touching the knee's hamstring. I snipped off a corner of the purple cloth. Um, we're talking about something about this, it's, it's, it's it. I'll talk about it in a minute. Of one of them, and we could not move, move away. The Arab said to me, maybe you took something from them, return it. For we have a tradition that he who takes anything from them cannot move away. I went and returned it, and then we were able to move away. When I came before the rabbis, they said to me, every Abba, his name is Rabba, but also Abba. Every Abba is an ass and every Barbar Khana is a fool. What, for what purpose did you do that? To know whether the law is according with the decision of the house of Shammai or the house of Philad. I'll talk about it in a minute. You should have counted the threads and joints. The Arab also said to me, come and I'll show you Mount Sinai. I went and saw that it was surrounded by scorpions which st stood there as large as white asses. And then, and then I heard divine voice, woe to me that I uttered an oath, who will nullify it for me? When I came back before the rabbis, they said to me, every Abba is an ass and every Barbar Khana is a fool. You should have said your oath is nullified. The scout invites Rav Barbar Khana to witness two of the Jewish people's mythical representation, the Israelites who died in the wilderness after escaping Egypt and Mount Sinai. These are, these are special spaces wherein time has stopped and they exist therefore as a frozen images from the Jewish people's ancient past. Within the story itself, the two images are con uh, constructed with the most prominent uh, representatives of the, con of the contemporary establishment, the rabbis who are trying in vain to produce some legal dis discourse out of the mythical one. In the first instance, Rabbi Barbar Khanna meets the desert dead, those giant representatives of the wilderness generation. Their rebelliousness and existential fear led them to test the Lord time and time again. Then following the sin, of the 12 spies got the decreed that they would all die in the desert. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, how long shall I bear with this evil congregation who complain against me? I have heard the complaints which the children of Israel make against me. Say to them, as I, I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. The carcasses of you, of you who have uh, complained against me shall fall in this wilderness and you of all of you who were numbered according to your entire number from 20 years old and above, except for Caleb, the son of Yefune and Yeshua, the son of Nun, you shall by no means enter the land which I swore I would, I would make you dwell in, but your little ones whom you said would be victims I will bring in and they shall know the land which you have despised. But as for you, your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness 
and your sons shall be shepherds in the wilderness for 40 years and bear the burden of your infidelity until your carcasses are consumed in the wilderness according to the number of days in which you sp you spied out the land 40 days for each day you shall bear the guilt one year namely 40 years and you shall know my rejection i am i the lord have spoken this i will surely do so to all these evil congregation who are gathering together against me in this wilderness they shall be consumed and they there they shall die the awful sentence uh, embodied in the assertion that the carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness led the sages in various places to imagine and depict the way that the dead generation perished in the wilderness thus in Eicharapa, a midrash on the book of lamentation composed in the land of israel around the sixth century ce the following description is giving of the cruel uh, death year year in and year out of those who had come out of egypt and let's read from ecclesiastic rabbi said rabbi levi every ninth of av ninth of av is a fast one of the two major fasts of the jewish tradition moses would put out an announcement all over the camp saying get out and dig and they would go out and dig graves and sleep in them at sunrise he would put out a, a proclamation saying get up and separate the dead from the living and they and they would stand and take out themselves 15,000 missing from the 600,000 that is to say for 40 years every on every ninth of of the month of av the israelites who had escaped egypt would enter the graves that they themselves had, had dug in advance and 15 15 thousands of them would not raise up the following morning this this create a horrible trail of tombs following the course that the israelites traveled in the desert in the second shorter tale the scout uh, leads, leads Rabbi Barbarchana to Mount Sinai, pictured as a surrounded by scorpions, which, like the desert dead in the previous tale, are enormous and resemble white asses. Into this scene comes the divine voice, which called uh, uh, forth desperately, Who is me that I uttered an oath? Who will nullify it for me? The text does not spell out the nature of this lamentable oath that the divine voice wishes to be nullified, but the many interpreters, with Bialik and Ravnitsky following them, understood the oath as ref referring to the punishment of exile that God had meted out to his people. According to this interpretation, the divine voice is asking in the name of God, that the oath, oath be broken and bearing an end to Jewish exile. In both in instances, upon his return, Rabbi Barbarchana uh, relates his travels to the rabbis, and in both cases, they respond viciously, telling him that every Abba is an ass and every Barbarchana is a fool. The reason for the sages' brutal reaction is their anger at, the fa at his failure to make the necessary connection between the mythical space and the real space or the space they are living in. The, the sages do not contest the existence of a different parallel universe where, wherein time has stopped in its tracks and the desert dead are lying half dead, half alive, and where the divine voice is persistently asking for someone to nullify its, his oath. They merely ask for something to bridge the gap between the mythical space and the real world, or in their case, the legal world, so that some legal meaning can be extracted from it. In the first instance of the desert dead, the purpose of the mythical voyage that 
was to know whether the law is according with the decision of the house of Shammai or the house of Hillel. The, the object that Rava Barbarchana wanted to extract from the mythical world and to transfer it into the real world was a thread of a tzitzit. Yeah, you can see the tzitzit here. Uh, a garment that according to Jewish law, every Jew must wear and whose main attribute is the tassels tied to each of its four corners. Kosher, wearable tassels must be tied in a specific way. The two schools of the house of Shammai and the house of Hillel disagree over the numbers of strings required for a kosher tzitzit. And I quote, the sages thought, how many strings does one place in a on a tzitzit? The house of Shammai say four strings and the house of Hillel says three strings, right? Rav Barbachana could have resolved this dispute with the tzitzit that he tried to take away with him. But this is impossible. As the Arab scout explained that one cannot take souvenirs. You cannot take souvenirs from the mythical space and transfer them to the other space, except that the rabbis dispute the scout's perspective, claiming, the, claiming instead that this breaking of boundaries is actually possible with the aid of one's memory. Thus they condemn Rava Barbarchana, you should have counted the threads and joints. The power of his memory could have transported the tzitzit from the space, one space to another and resolved this, the illegal con conundrum. For, for obviously the ancient tzitzit from the, the era of Moses itself, himself was the right and kosher tzitzit. So he could just transfer the tzitzit in his memory and he hadn't done it. The second case is somewhat different. In this case, the charge against Rabba Barbarchana is that he did not act inside the mythical space itself to relieve God of his oath. As the rabbis put it, you should have said your oath is nullified. As opposed to, the, to Rabba Barbarchana who viewed himself as a bystander in the irredeemable scene where the divine voice forever laments God's unnecessary oath, the, says, the sages wishes to interpret the situation from the legal point of view. They therefore express their puzzlement over Rav Barbarchana failure to do the obvious thing, nullify God's oath, and thereby end the vicious cycle of mythical times. And if God's oath indeed refers to Jewish exile, then its nullification would in turn end exile itself and bring about redemption. Paradoxically, of course, this would also bring historical time to an end and transport the Jewish people into different redemptive and obviously mythical temporal dimension. Now I'd like to turn to these two tales as they are presented in Sefer Agada. Now you can see, I won't read it, but you, you can see that, you can see them uh, on the screen. As you can see, Bialik and Ravnitska version is very, very similar to the Talmudic one, except for one unmarked omission. In the first tale about the desert dead, Rava Barbachana return to the study house is omitted. And so, and so it is the mocking response of the sages. In Bialik and Ravnitsky version, the story ends when the stolen tzitzit is returned to its owner. And we were able to move on. That's the end of the story in uh, Sefer Agadah. This omission become even more interesting and complex in light of the second tale. This is the second tale. About Mount Sinai, where the mocking response of the rabbis, you should have said your oath is nullified, is represented and preserved. So clearly the editors did not think that the dialogue with the rabbis was mere afterthought for they did include it in the Mount Sinai story, something else must have concerned them, causing them to omit the dialogue from the first tale, but leave it in the second one.
okay? In order to comprehend this complex editing, you have to understand that taking out a line of rabbinic story is a very aggressive thing to do because they're not dealing with simple stories, they are dealing with the Talmud itself. And when they are transferring a Talmudic story from the Talmud to their book and they are taking out a line, they are doing it with, they have some kind of an aim or a purpose for that because censorship basically is a very, very violent thing to do. You don't just censorship, censor something, definitely you do, you're not just censoring the Talmud itself. So when Bialik and Ravnitsky are doing it, something is really bothering them. And we have to understand what's bothering or try to understand what's bothering them. In order to comprehend this complex editing, I think that we should add one more piece of information to the, to the discussion. And that is the central position of the myth of the dead of the desert in Bialik poetical work. Two poems by Bialik conduct a dialogue with a mythical image of those gigantic desert that Rava had met in the course of his travels. The first and slightly less known one is The Last Dead of the Desert, which he wrote in 1897. And in the uh, present, and now you can see it, and I'll read, the, the, and I'll, I'll read only the opening line. It's a very long poem. Arise, desert wanderers, and leave the, the wilderness. The road is long, the battles are many. Seize your rootless drifting in the wilderness. Before you lies a great open road. Forty years we have wandered between the mountains. Six hundred thousand corpses we have buried in the sand. Let not the corpses of the uh, falterers delay us. They died in slavery. Let us pass over them. They shall rot in their shame sprawled over their parcels, carried on their shoulders from Egypt. Let them dream pleasantly of onions, garlic, huge turns of meat. The opening lines of the poem describe the desert dead in the spirit of the biblical text as an obstacle to a new proud generation about to inherit the land and conquer it. And conquer it. In order to enter the land of Israel under Joshua, these weaklings who came out of Egypt must seemingly be left there to rot in their shame, sprawled over their parcels. The second and considerably better known poem is The Dead of the Wilderness, which was written some five years later in 1902. As opposed to the last the desert dead, which was in which the Talmudic intertextuality is hidden, this poem opened with a direct quote in Aramaic taken out of the Arab's word to Rava, to Rava Babakhana, come and I will show you the dead of the wilderness, including a mention of the exact Talmudic source. It's in the poem, it's like the motto of the poem. The opening of the poem suggests completely different view of the desert dead. They are described here as a massive army, 600,000 of giant sized, daring warriors who are ready to, uh, for battle, as you can see from the opening lines of the poem. Now, let's see the second poem. It is not an army of lions uh, caught in the sun with their young, uh, young ones. It is not the pride and for, for, frostest. frostest of uh, Bashan uprooted, uh, first of Bashan uprooted and fallen. These are, are the dead of the wilderness under the sunlight recum recumbent. Hard by their tents they are they lied like the children of Anak, Anak which means giant. First stature, stretch on the desolate sand like a numberless lions in slumber under the might of their limbs and the floor of the desert is hollowed. Armed as for battle, they sleep and clad in armor of giants. This poem merited a considerably amount of academic research references 
many of which have been compiled into a book titled On the Desert Dead, edited by Tzvi Luz. In this framework, I cannot get into the fascinating question whether this poem deals with the actual uprising of Jewish people or if it is of, of a more universal say, disposition uh, pertaining to men's rebelliousness against God. Either way, though Bialik consequently describes the, a fallen rebellion, the desert that rise for a brief moment, by, but eventually fall down again, the desert conceals, the, the desert conceals them and the rebellion disappears as if never took place. And I'll read the last beautiful lines of the poem. Slow sway the camels, their monstrous back till they fell in the brightness, bearing away from the desert one more of its marvelous legends. Stillness returned to the to as an of old desolate stretches of the desert. The desolate stretches the desert. At this point, I want I would like to go back to Sefer Agada and to the lines which I have um, and, and to the line which have been omitted from it. Given the mythical stature of the desert dead narrative in Bialik poetical world, it might be easier to understand why he wished to remove the dialogue with the sages from the story. The discussion conduct, conducted by the sages wishes to bend the mythical dimension into the framework of the legal one. The sages have little, if any, interest in the image of the desert dead, nor, for that matter, in their size or their might. What they are concerned with is what does their tzitzit look like. That's all. They're not interested in this gigantic creature and they're not interested in the mythical power of the story. To such reduction of the mythical dimension, Bialik cannot possibly agree. Giving this story is for him a powerful modern fable about re freedom, resistance, and an option of a rebellion. On the other hand, the Midrashic discussion in the second tale can and perhaps should be left as is, for in it, the sages angrily tell Rabbi Bar Barchana that he have should nullify God's oath, because nullifying that oath, oath mean the end of exile and the beginning of a new era. And integrating in, in, and in gathering of exiles and redem, redemption, which are indeed compatible with the desirable nation ethos of Sefer Agada editors. In a speech, now I conclude, in a speech given in London in 1926, Bialik unfolds the ideological uh, infrastructure which stood at the basis of the, of the editing of ancient sources. Bialik revealed a clear political awareness, wishing to make usage of this literary anthology as a, power, as a powerful propagandic tool in the process of shaping the people's consciousness. And I'll quote from this lecture. The better kind of propaganda is not, the, is not direct propaganda, but rather the training of the hearts as well as, as in, instilling recognition of an adora adoration for our creative powers. If our tongue thrives, if we cast light on every corner of our, our creation, it shall be acknowledged by the entire diaspora who will follow us wholeheartedly. Contrary to his uh, moderate statements in the introduction to Sefer Agada, which I quoted at the beginning of my lecture, here Bialik disclosed with great honesty the aim, the main purpose of this anthology, and that is the shaping of a national awareness of the people. In such a process, the original text itself turns somewhat more temperate when faced with the national didactic purpose intended for it. Thus, 
the escapades of uh, Rava Barbar Khanna, some as, uh, same as numerous other stories in Sefer Agada are bent to the theological discourse the editor wish to bestow upon their readers. Thank you very, very much for being with, here with me and not leaving at the, in the middle, I don't know. And now, Tobias or... Uh, yeah, so before we enter the discussion, so to give you some time to uh, think about your real questions, I was asked to offer a few lines uh, of response. And of course, although I have learned a lot uh, from working with uh, friends like Chaim or Michal over the years, and also I'm fascinated with the mis mysterious world of rabbinic literature, I am, of course, not an expert on this vast corpus of text. So my response to Chaim's wonderful lecture cannot be about the details of uh, the interpretation of rabbinic sources. Uh, I learned a lot. The sources he quotes and their relation to the modern anthology. I think this is fully convinced. Chaim's concern, however, touches in many ways on issues and problems that are important to my own thinking as well. First, Dealing with canonical texts, these writings which are crucial for the self-understanding and self-construction of religious groups is anything but an innocent enterprise. Where we do not approach this text in a philologically appropriate and critical perspective that also takes historical and literary aspects into account, there is at least the danger that these writings, or what we regard as their message, can show or develop a destructive, and in some cases, at least when I talk about the Bible and what uh, we have in the Christian reception of the Bible, in some cases, even death bringing potential. I am sure that all of us still have in our minds the image of Donald Trump demonstra demonstratively holding a Bible into the camera by people who support the Black Lives Matter movement were beaten up no four of them from the White House. Here in Regensburg at my chair, we have repeatedly worked on projects that deal with the use of the Bible, including the publication of a de Judaized New Testament during the Nazi era. Ute Leingruber's project on the spiritual and sexual abuse of women in the Catholic Church in turn also points to the role of biblical writings in such contexts. The list could be continued. My second point. The manners in which authoritative, canonical, biblical texts have become imprinted into our cultural memory, into our constructions of the past, sometimes uh, the constructions of a mythical past, often have very little to do with the stories they really tell us. The various media by means of which biblical texts are transported, the selection of texts that are usually seen as important, more important than others, uh, and even the ways they are translated into different languages dramatically influence what ideas we regard and use as biblical, authoritative, and which we do not. It is important to look at the detail like Heim did uh, in his lecture. I would like to mention two examples from the New Testament or related to the Bible. John 1968, at the end of Jesus' interrogation before Pilate, we read the short phrase, Thereupon he delivered him up to them to be crucified. The first part of the sentence, the references are clear. Pilate hands over the condemned Jesus to be crucified. But to whom? From a purely historical point of view, it's clear to the Roman soldiers. But the Gospel of John is first and foremost a literary text. I should always narrate what we regard as historically plausible. If you follow the immediate context, it would have to be the high priest mentioned in John 1915. But a few verses later, they spoke of probably Roman soldiers who crucified Jesus. Modern commentaries, especially in the German speaking world, tend towards the second solution Jesus is handed over to Roman soldiers. But for the famous church father Augustine, for example, it was clear Pilate handed over Jesus to the high priest, the representatives of the Jews. A tiny exegetical decision, perhaps even appropriate to the flow of the text, and yet serious in the extreme. The disastrous stereotype, the Jews crucified our Lord Jesus, which has had an effect for centuries right up to our time, a catastrophic effect, 
can be traced back to uncritical repetitions of such incomparable interpretations. Another short example. Perhaps you remember children's Bibles, religious education, or sermons in which biblical figures were presented to you as role models, saints whose ideal you can only fail to live up in your own life. In my school days, for example, I liked the stories about the tragically ending friendship between future King David and Jonathan, the prince from the house of Saul, and narratives about mutual support, trust, and saving each other's lives. The story about the last meeting of the two, 1 Samuel 20, 35 to 42, is usually neglected. Using a wrong excuse, Jonathan sends away the servant who accompanies him. David and Jonathan want to be alone. They kiss each other and weep. We meet two men who behave in an incredibly tender and loving way with each other. Could it be that the Bible holds constructions of gender that were and are rather suppressed in conservative religious education classes? Including the above passage, I love this story even more than I did during my childhood. Biblical texts and rabbinic narratives have one thing in common. As grand narratives consisting of many small stories, they challenge our own images of the world and our ideas of what it means to be human. The extent to which they continue to affect us can be seen in their many reenactments we encounter in anthologies, in art, retellings, paraphrases, movies, but also in apocryphal literature. New old narratives that we must, however, keep a very close eye on if we want to understand what they want to do with us. For one thing seems certain to me, it is not only human beings who create narratives. It is narratives that create us in many different ways as human beings. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now forget my wordings, and now it is time for real questions uh, to Hein. So who would like to start? Ursula? Ah, I see. Yeah. Yes. Yes, Heim. Thank you very much for this lecture. Um, I'm a German literature researcher, and I'm very interested in the distribution of this book. When does it uh, come up? When, who has been reading it? And how is um, a maybe connection to uh, intertextuals for, for this reasons? Okay. I couldn't figure out um, by Googling how <laughs> <laughs> this information. Yeah, Google doesn't have everything. Oh, no. <laughs> Almost everything, but not everything. Still have our corners that Google doesn't okay. cover. Gladly enough, the book was originally meant for children. The idea was to create for young adults. Now we have books for young adults, we call it. The, the, the idea was to create a book for young adults so they can relate or read ancient stories. But eventually it became very, very popular. They, they didn't thought or meant it to be such a popular book, but it, be, it was really, it was originally printed in 1908, the first edition, which is a short edition, very hard to find. If any of you find the original edition, I'll be happy to pay a lot of money to have a copy of it, if you get to, uh, but they, they printed the first edition, and then in 1911, they printed a second larger edition. And eventually, in 1934, after the death of uh, Chaim Nachman Bialik, uh, Ravnitsky printed a whole full edition. This is the edition that you see. This, this is the edition. In like 10 years ago, they reprint, they, they created a new edition. I have a lot to say about the new edition that was created in Jerusalem. It's a, I don't like it very much. I have a lot of, but this book is, is at the same time the gateway to rabbinic literature and a, smoke, and a smoke screen that prevent people from getting to rabbinic literature. Usually when you, at schools, 
teachers, poets, writers, people who are not accustomed with the rabbinic literature and doesn't know how to get to rabbinic literature and Michal sits here, it's not easy to get into rabbinic literature. It's a very, it's a very complicated thing. You have to find yourself, your way in rabbinic literature. Usually when people in Israel are quoting rabbinic literature, they are quoting Sefer Agadah. Now I'll say two different things about Sefer Agadah. First of all, if you read the uh, Sefer Agadah, you, you, you may think that there's no influence on Jew Jewish culture is a very closed culture. There is no Christianity, no Roman influence, no Greek influence, nothing. It's a very closed and uninfluent, nothing influenced Jewish culture. It's a culture that creates its own, created by its own and no other influence. And of course, it has something to do with national ideas and what kind of influence we had or didn't have during our years at, uh, in, in exile. Now, if you open the book and you, you go to the, the book is organized, the first part of, of the book is organized by historical, uh, th there's kind of historical order to it. It's beginning with the creation of the world and then biblical era and the first temple era and the second temple era. Now history, according to Bialik and Ravnitsky, and that's important, History ends at the destruction of the second temple. There is no other historical chapters to, to the book. After the destruction of the, the temple, the, the book moves to something else. It's, they are starting to tell rabbinic stories about the rabbis, but it's not an historical account anymore. Because in Zionist imagination or cultural imagination, history ended when the temple was destroyed because we lost independence. We are not independ independent. It's some kind of a Zionist idea that history ended with the destruction of the temple. And of course, history would start again when the Israelites or the Jewish people would come back to the land of Israel and create their own history. As long as we are in, on ex in exile under the control of other countries, there is no, we are out of history. So if you open the book, even the structure of the book has a very deep ideological infrastructure. It, it's supposed to create an idea of Jewish history, when Jewish history started, when it ended, and when it should restart again. I hope that answered the... Yes, thanks so much. It's a very popular book. When I was young, and the world was a more just place and we had bar mitzvahs. That's the party that you do, do when you're 13. Now everybody brings money, a lot of money. You're, and they're not bringing money anymore. They're transferring it with an, an app. So you don't even have to bring the money. But when we were kids, we used to get books. And usually kids in the circle that I grew up in, the religion, in religious families, Michal probably knows it as well, I got 10 copies of this book. I have at home, ten copy. if you want, I can send everybody a copy. I have a lot of copies of this book. Every child got a copy of this book to his bar mitzvah because here, <laughs> Michal has it, everybody has it. You get it for you, but bat mitzvah or bar mitzvah, it's kind of initiation riot. You have to get it, you have to read it. You have, this is the gateway to your own culture. This is the gateway through which you move and look at, at your own culture. And you don't have to be a Talmudic scholar. You can just read it. That's the beauty of it. Uh, can I just add something because it really fits in what you said, because I want to highlight what you said before about it being a gateway, but on the other way, a smokescreen. That's such an important point because we have to deal with this with our students. Yeah. I prefer people who don't know anything than people who went through Sefer Agadah because it gets, it, it, you get, uh, um, well, as, as a female who's, you know, this, this, for, 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 for people who don't have access at all, not for the language and are prohibited from studying this for sure. But even for male students, this is, this is what Chaim is saying is so important because it really highlights the problem of giving information in a mediated way 
where you don't have access to the actual thing. And this is something that we as, as, as professor, we have to deal with it because they know the story and have been told the story for years since they were 13 and got this for their bar mitzvah, but it's the wrong story and it's warped and it's, 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 it's not representative of the real richness and the real complexity of rabbinic literature. And what Chaim is doing is so important by highlighting the problematic nature of both giving access, but on the other hand, you know, giving access to a partial image of this. It's, I, I just, I'll just add to what Michal just said. If we have students who want to write something about rabbinic literature, and they are not, if they do, usually when we have students that did not grow up in religious families and did not grow up in education, the, the religious educational system, they, didn't, they, they don't have experience with rabbinic literature. And we have to start all over from scratch with them. They don't know how to access this literature. It's like a big secret for them. So I tell them, go to the Book of, book of Legend, take the book, find a story that you like, or interest you, and then go to the Talmud and find the real story because you'll find, usually you'll find differences. So this is a good way to, to find a story or a, in, in, uh, or a character or a subject that you want to work on, but then you are not allowed to use it when writing your, your work because this is not the Talmud. This is something completely different than the Talmud. Yeah. Thank you, Michal. Uh, I have uh, four more questions, if I'm okay. Uh, I think Europe was number one. Then we have Harald, Luigi, and Sabine. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Europe, if you start. Yes. Uh, thank you, Chaim, for this uh, really fascinating lecture, which is a quite a different world from from ours, of course. I was I was hermeneutically struck by your remark. Uh, you can take a souvenir, but you must take it uh, by memory. Yeah. Um, and of course, this allows a, a great freedom in, in dealing with all these stories and so, uh, but on the other hand, it's, it's the question, and I, 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 it's also my question, what is then the criterion uh, that the memory does not lead us astray in, in uh, all the various directions? So is yeah. there a criterion in rabbinic hermeneutics uh, for, for, uh, for using the memory uh, in... Uh, in contrast with the souvenir or the historical reconstruction or what, what we, we usually do? Yeah, that's a great question. And I don't know if I have, if there is, or I have a correct answer for it. They're living in a world where they're not almost, it's hard to imagine it, but they don't have texts. They're not reading from text. They are studying and they have all kinds of functions in the Bet Midrash, of people who have, a, who have a good memory and they are standing and retelling and retelling this, the, the material that they are studying. And we are talking about huge amount of material. And memory is one of the main tools that they are, they are using. And they, in a way, now Rava Bar Barchana is one of those guys who, who goes to the land of Israel and bring with his memory, the, 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 their question is even bigger because that's what you, he usually does. He's going to the land of Israel. He brings, not, he, he doesn't bring anything written. He's memorizing a lot of material and bringing it back from the land of Israel to Babylonia. And then he's, re, he's telling them, I heard from that rabbi this and I heard from that rabbi that. And we have a tradition from this rabbi and from that rabbi. And it's a hold. It's a whole, and I'd be happy if Michal would join me or say something in addition to that. It's a whole tradition that is based on memory. I have a very good friend now, uh, Mira Balberg. She's writing a book about forgetful, forgetting things or how rabbinic culture constructed forgetfulness in its own culture because they have to remember so many things. So in addition to what they have to remember, they have to remember what they don't remember. And it's, it's a complicated thing because they have to remember what the, the discussion between the house of Shammai and the house of Hillel about the tzitzit. Now we have it in written, but they don't have it in written. They, they just memorize it. And they want to end another layer to what they already know and remember about the dispute over the tzitzit. And that the layer that 
רבה בר בר חנה כן עד, and he can do it there fully in order to, to transfer the, what, what he has seen in the desert into a legal material, they have to believe that what he saw, he really saw. So th- that means that he, they must believe or understand that he really saw those gigantic creatures. Now what Bialik, the problem of Bialik was that they, w- they didn't care about those gigantic creatures. They're, they're not interested in that. It's like, yeah, no, we, we know that they live there somewhere in the desert. We don't care. You found them. That's very nice of you. We are interested in one specific question. You could have come with, a quest, with an answer to a question because your memory is the best tool that you have. You don't have to take a souvenir from there. You can take it by just memorizing that. And the whole, it's a whole culture built on a, the memory of, on, on a memory. They, they just, they study without books. Right, Michal? I, I don't want Tobias to kill me for, for jumping in out of no, line, no. but- <laughs> I invited you. I, so I'll, I'll, add, I'll add a sentence. I know it's German, it's not Israel. I, I'm adding a, 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 one more sentence. So I think about the oral culture, it's very important because uh, it's true that they did everything orally, but they had people who were walking books yeah. who were used in, in place of, of writing. So they had system to overcome this oral yeah, that's what decision. I said. But, I, but, but, but what I add, uh, what I uh, emphasize in your talk, Chaim, even more, is the gap sometimes between the humor or the exaggeration of the original story and the way it's treated by the tradition collectors, right? Yeah. So they're very serious about the memory and what they want. So they sometimes ignore the humor of the, of the blatant exaggeration of the original yeah. story uh, when, when they're treating it. So the memory comes in, it's problematic. So they want to remember things, so they're super serious about this. But sometimes it kind of the gap between the layers and the genre of literature. You see this very clearly when you turn to the interpretations of the time. <laughs> Meaning in medieval time, when they read these texts, they lack humor. They read this and they're, you know, when you read rabbinic literature, sometimes it's very funny and it's obviously funny, but when they, they, the medieval commentators want to talk about halakha or legal laws and something, they're so serious. And sometimes you're like, this is, shouldn't be treated, you know, seriously. And Rabbi Babahan is a good example for that. You know, they start, you know, negotiating the, the size and, and whatever, all kinds of stuff. So the memory issue and the oral issue is problematic when you're trying, where you're dealing with literature and when you're dealing with the different strata of literature, when you're talking about an entire culture that's dependent on memory, as Chaim said, this is what they have. They have to take this very seriously. So it some com- sometimes interfere. Uh, and I think- uh, I'll just add, they are very target orientated sometimes. They really know, need to know what the tzitzit look like. So they are willing to accept the whole package of the story around it. Now in the Middle Ages, like Maimonides, Maimonides really didn't like those stories. And he was puzzled by the stories. <clears throat> and he, 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 he was saying like, okay, if you really need to read it, read it, but it's really unnecessary to read those stories. Those stories are weird. They are crazy. It's not just funny. They are creating and recreating and recreating world after world after world after world, and they're creating options. And those options can be dangerous sometimes. It's not that these stories are just funny or crazy or weird. They, try to think about the second story. God is asking human to nullify his oath. He's God, he can nullify his own oath. He doesn't need people to do, to do the nullification of the oath. God is standing in the desert, not his own voice, but it's like a female representation of God's voice. And this voice is standing there for hundreds of years and says, who's gonna nullify my oath? You are God, you can nullify your own oath. It's, it's no problem, but the rabbis are not as saying, how come God did not nullify his own oath? They're attacking Rava Barbachana that he didn't help God to nullify his own, in his own oath. So in these stories, there is almost the, a smell or a danger of heretic stories, stories that change the relationship between human and God, the relationship between the Israelites and their God. God is many in many of those stories 
is presented as weak, as unable to do his work, as one who needs the help of his own people to do, to do simple things. And the structure of the relationship is turned upside down. And that's also what worries people like Maimonides and others, because the story, these stories are not simple. They are creating worlds that is complicated to deal with. Uh, I think Harald is the next question. Yeah, Harald, hi. Uh, thank you very much, Chaim. It's a great pleasure uh, to see you and that I very much enjoyed your lecture and I just regret that I cannot be in Regensburg these days. It's just my 14th day after my second vaccination, so I resume commuting next week. So, um, but then hopefully see Michal uh, at, towards the end of the, of the month in Regensburg and see you, Chaim. Mazel Tov for the vaccination, anyway. <laughs> but uh, I, I I'm, was impressed by, by your reviving the literary world and, and of course, by the ide ide ideological criticism and then the ide ideological critical element of your talk. And I was intrigued by uh, the removal of popular religion uh, in the compilation of the Sefer Agada. Um, but I wanted to follow up on Professor Regener's question about audience and the role of language in the Sefer Agada. And this question comes from total ignorance on my side. Did he want, did he, by his compilation, address an existing Hebrew readership or did he want to create uh, a Hebrew readership? Um, um, because uh, how does it relate to the revival or pro propagation of, of, of Hebrew as a spoken language uh, between uh, Russia, Germany, and the land of Israel? And does he address the pious? Does he address the assimilated? Uh, how does a nationalism, a nascent nationalism uh, tie in? Uh, could you dwell on that a bit? Yeah. First of all, it's a, it's a great question and a very complicated one because it's a very influential book. When you have such an influential book, it's one of the most imprinted books in, in Israel until today. It was printed in hundreds of thousands of copies of the book are still printed. So Bialik wanted to perceive himself. It's, it's much more complicated than that, but he, he wanted to look at, at himself as like the protector of the, the simple people, as the one who is mediating Jewish culture to the simple people. He didn't like acad people of the academia. He mocked them. He thought that we are, um, we are I'm using the we, but the, the professor at the academia are sitting there, not interested in the, in the people. And he thought that the first and foremost role of academia is to make Jewish culture accessible to everybody. So we thought, and he said it at 1925, when they opened the Hebrew University at Jerusalem, he said in the, at, at his lecture, it's a, it's a very famous lecture by Bialik, he stood there as the national poet. He was a very, very admirable figure. And he said, the role of the academia is to make Jewish culture accessible to everybody. Now, it's not an, as simple as that because it's not just making the culture accessible and it's creating the culture itself. So it's creating the image of the culture that you want people to have. Now, there, it, it, it's definitely part of the Hebrew revival in Jewish culture, in, the, in Israel and in Jewish culture. People had, they, there were no books. If you want to educate your kids in Hebrew and to have, they, there are no books. They, they needed books. And that book definitely fill up a gap that was because <laughs> there was no accessible treasure of uh, rabbinic literature uh, stories until Bialik and Ben Ravnitsky have done what they've done in such a scale. So, yes, but um, it's not meant to, in, in the 20 years or 30 years after it was published, there was a serum, uh, instance in Tiberias when rabbis burned the book. It was burned by rabbis because 
in a way they understood exactly what this book wants to do and how successful it is. And they were afraid of the book. And of course, when I was a student at the yeshiva, I, we were not allowed to use this book. It was not allowed to have it. It was not on the shelves at the study house because the rabbis understood that this book uh, is so successful in, in a way that people would prefer to use it rather than reading the Talmud itself. Now, the, the most, from their perspective, the most dangerous thing that the, this book does, it takes all the legal parts of the Talmud out of the story. There's, there are no legal parts to the Talmud anymore. There are only stories. But if you read the Talmud, of course, most of the Talmud are legal discussions and not stories. Bialik and Ravnitsky wanted to create, they, they were not interested in the halachic, in the law. They were interested in stories. And they created some, some kind of a book which shows that, yeah, this is the Talmud. It has only stories in it. And they took out all the legal, almost all the legal discussions out of the book and created some kind of national treasure of rabbinic literature without any access to its legal parts. So that's why usually nowadays, I think teachers at schools in religious, but not ultra-Orthodox religious schools, but the modern Orthodox schools, secular schools, definitely, even universities, scholars who are not used to use rabbinic literature, but need it from time to time. There's a famous historian, military historian of the ancient world called Yoshafat Al-Kabi. Yoshafat Al-Kabi wrote extensively about the Bar Kokhva rebellion. And he said at, at the beginning of, of his book, and it's amazing that historian of ancient, ancient history historian, who's well versed in sources says, I did not read the stories in the Talmud. I only read them in Sefer Agada. And he made many mistakes by using Sefer Agada and not rabbinic sources themselves. And uh, but it's it's so common and so popular that yeah, that's I hope that answers the, your question. I have two more questions. Yeah. Uh, I think Luigi was first, and then Sabine. So Luigi, uh, please. Yes, well, thank you very much for this wonderful lecture and uh, especially for the wonderful discussion. I, I'm really enjoying this. Um, well, you, you touch upon so many interesting points that I, I don't know where to start from. Uh, <laughs> ju just two questions. One about the general purpose. You, in some way, you already replied, but I wanted to, to hear more about this. And uh, the other question is about the method. So the first one um, about the purpose. Uh, I was wondering, uh, um, starting from the, the main idea behind uh, our Beyond the Canon project, that is to say to look at extra canonical texts and traditions as heterotopias of yeah. religious authority. I was wondering, okay, uh, do you think that uh, the category of heterotopia fit to the material and the use of the material made by uh, Bialik uh, with, with the Sefer Agada? I mean, uh, in, the, in the sense of Foucault. So yeah. other spaces with respect to a main authority. So my question is, what is the authority challenged or mirrored by uh, Bialik and, uh, and, and Ravnitsky. Okay. So is it uh, just the Talmud? Is it, uh, I don't know, uh, religious authority in general? Is it the Bible or is it uh, Allah, as you mentioned? And, and in this case, in this latter case, uh, can we look at the Agadah and the use of the Agadah as a way to build another kind of halakha, maybe, or maybe it's just a stupid question, I don't know. But second question is about the method. Uh, this is more technical, uh, uh, but it stems from uh, an interest that I have in uh, folklore studies uh, uh, at the moment. I, I wanted to know if um, 
the editors had as a model uh, maybe um, some uh, uh, analogous operations that we had in Europe. Uh, I think uh, of Brothers Grimm, for example, in uh, in trading folklore, uh, Jewish folklore. So, but I, I know that this is a wide question. So, yeah. okay, I'll start with the first question regarding the heterotopia. The Foucault. I don't know exactly whether it's a heterotopia in a Foucaultian sense or not, but Bialik and Ravnitsky preferred some sources and refrained from dealing with other sources. It's especially, uh, yeah, I don't know, blood and, it's especially clear when you come to the difference between the Talmud, the Palestinian Talmud and the Babylonian Talmud. The Babylonian Talmud, which is much more common Talmud, and it's the people Talmud. That's the Talmud that everybody, when you say Talmud in general, you're always referring to the Babylonian Talmud, not the Palestinian Talmud. And they almost never refer to the, uh, to the Palestinian Talmud, they refer to the Palestinian Talmud, but they really, pref they prefer the Babylonian Talmud because it's much more familiar and people know it and it's more accessible than the Palestinian Talmud. And that is part of their like, I don't know, um, um, a fight, it's not exactly a fight, but they wanted to make Sefer Agada an intellectual book. It's not an intellectual book. It's not book for intellectuals. It's book, for the people. That also, that's why they almost never used many Talmudic manuscripts. They only use, they, I have some uh, proofs that they used manuscript, even in the second story, in the Sefer Agadai, it's, it's, it's uh, gentle, but in Sefer Agadai, he says, you should have said it, it's nullified, it's nullified. They say twice the nullify. And the twice, the, it's only in the manuscript, it's not in the printed edition. So from time to time, they use the printed, the, the manuscript of that, the printed edition. But they say the printed edition is the edition of the people. People do not study manuscripts. And we are not scholars, we're not professors at the university, and we are not going to use manuscript that nobody knows. And we will use the printed edition because the printed edition is the best edition. So that's, about, I don't know if it's about the heterotopia, but it's about the ethos of the book. And it, it's connect, it has a connection to your other question. They had a very good idea of their ideal reader. Their ideal reader is definitely European. They didn't know any other commun Jewish communities back then. Is European, East European Jew, who was interested in in, a, in, Rabbi, in its own culture, but he has some kind of bourgeoisie even culture. He, he's not, he would not feel comfortable with stories that have, for, I'll give you a, a short, simple instance. I wanted to include it in the lecture, but then we would be sitting here for hours and hours and I don't, that, I don't want to do anything like that to you all. So there's a story about Rabbi Yehuda the Prince, Rabbi Yehuda, the editor of the Mishnah. He's Rabbi Yehuda Nasi, Rabbi Yehuda the Patriarch, Rabbi Yehuda the Prince. He, there's, he's a very, very important figure. Now he died. He died in the bathroom, okay, from diarrhea. And the Talmud tells a very specific story about his death. It's always complicated to bring those stories to people who doesn't know the Talmud because it's weird stories, but that's the beauty of those stories because it's weird. Now, he died from diarrhea in the bathroom. And not just he died from diarrhea. The rabbi says, just people, righteous people die from diarrhea. That's the way that saints die. That's the right way for saints to die. They are dying from diarrhea. Now, they, of course, it was a huge problem back then. The people... Their diet was very bad and they died very young from many times from the area. But the fact is that Bialik and Ravnitsky sat there and said, it's not possible that we will describe our leader 
Rabbi Yehuda, the prince, the patriarch, the editor of the Mishnah, is dying from diarrhea. So they just took the line off the story. If you open the book of legend on stories of Rabbi Yehuda, the, uh, the, the prince, and you read the story about his death, you get a very European story. He was suffering. They say that he was suffering. He was miserable, but they don't say why he was suffering, or why he was miserable. But you get a whole new European story built upon, I don't know, formula, the, the formula of European legend. It's a story about the saint, a Jewish saint. And he was suffering, of course, because saints have to suffer. That's their destiny. They are meant to suffer. They're, they like it, they are suffering, and that's the way that they prove that they are saints. But there is a certain of right suffering and wrong suffering. And you, suffering in bathroom and dying from diarrhea is the wrong kind of suffering, and you need to give him his, the right way, the right suffering. So they, they just said he was suffering. Nobody knows from what. And when you go to the Talmud, of course, you find because they have this kind of image. They wanted, in, in a way, and that's complicated, like the Green Brothers, they wanted to protect the readers from certain uh, kind of ideas that there are in the stories that they said, our reader cannot read it. And actually, it's not a problem of the reader. It's their own problem, of course. They didn't want that kind of information or knowledge in the stories. And they wanted to take it out, but they blamed the reader because they, of course, are not simple readers. They are not simple people. They are very sophisticated people. But the simple people, the ordinary people, the their their simple readers, as the the spirit of the people, as they call it, cannot tolerate the idea that Rabbi Judah, the, Judah the Prince, died from diarrhea. So they took it out. But actually, they they Bialik and Ravnitsky are the ideal readers of Bialik and Ravnitsky. And they don't like the idea. So they took out, I can give you a million examples for that. I'll give you one more and that's it because I don't want to drag it. There's a story of Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva was a very prominent Amora, a Tana, one of the most famous Amor, a Tanaim of, in the land of Israel. And the story goes that he went to study for 24 years. The story in the Talmud, Masechet Nedarim and Masechet Ketubot, tells the two versions, but in the, both versions, Rabbi Akiva is sent by his wife. Yeah, It's the Dona Ideala. The, his wife is sending him to study. He's not just going. He's sent by, sent by his wife to study. He's going for 12 years, and then he comes back. He comes home with 12,000 students with him. And then he hears behind the wall that his wife says, it's a long dialogue, but she says eventually, if he would listen to me, he would go and study another 12 years. So he's not entering, he's just, okay. He's going back, not entering the house, not having coffee with his wife, nothing. He's going back, studying another 12 years and returns with 24,000 students. And then there's, he's, there's a big entrance to the city and you can read the story. Now, in the first edition of the book, Rabbi Akiva is going for 24 years, as in the Talmudic stories. In the second edition of the book, he's going on it for 12 years. They took out 12 years and 12,000 students with it. Now, you can ask yourself why they took 12 years. What's the problem with 24 years? And the answer is 24 years is too much. 12 years, it's nice. 12 years is nice. You can still have a family. The idea is that you can still have a family and have children if you are going for 12 years. If you are going for 24 years, that's a whole new story. And that's, they, they thought, I think, I, don't, I, I wish I could be in Odessa at the time and at the room when they were editing, but it's not they're editing the Talmud, they're editing themselves. Because they put it in the first edition and they took it out in the second edition. So something really bothers them. They were really annoyed by the idea that he's going for 24 years because that way he won't be able to have a family. 24 years, it's too much. So they took out 12 years and 12,000 students. And that's 
the way if you open the book now you have 12 so what bothers them is not the, the reader some kind of unknown reader but what bothers them is Bialik and Ravnitsky themselves they are the readers of Bialik and Ravnitsky and they don't like some of the stories or some elements in the stories sorry for the long answer I apologize I have uh, Sabine thank you <laughs> Um, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful your lecture, this beautiful discussion. It's amazing. We, I think, we all want that time stops and that we can continue this kind of. Um, I can bring two rabbis; they would stop the time. They, they have done <laughs> much more complicated things than that. So. Um, I, I have a question. So, in um, in reality, uh, these are three questions, and in a way, they also follow up um, Ursula Regener's question and Harald Buchinger's question. And I think it's a kind of midrashic things uh, which is going on, but maybe I um, there are, there are other sides coming up now with my question and and now you mentioned Odessa I, I would like to come back to the place of origin where this story was these stories were compiled and um, I was very impressed by this um, double image that the Sefer Haggadah is the gateway uh, to um, to rabbinic uh, tradition and it's uh, at the same time it helps this uh, great early tradition disappearing. So we have the other shield of the, uh, the other side of the shield. And um, so I was wondering, this is my first question. I think we have a similar situation. If you look at the historical situation, um, uh, Bialik is in Odessa. We had the situation of 03, the yeah. pogrom, uh, Kishinev pogrom. Yeah. We have the situation of 05, the revolution in Odessa, the upheaval and a very th a threat of Jewish culture. So, yeah. but at the same time, we have a huge Jewish cultural renaissance. You spoke of the Hebrew renaissance, yeah. and I would to I would like to see it in a more broader perspective as part of the Jewish cultural renaissance uh, during the time of its annihilation. So it's a it's a kind of tension which is unique in, I think, in, 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 in this period that you have this moment of Jewish renaissances. So you have the Ivreska Kultura, Yiddish Kultur, Tarbut yeah. Ivrit. Um, so you have, you, you have this project within this large project of uh, Jewish cultural renaissance. And um, my question, my first question is, it's related also to the readership. At that time when they did the book, um, uh, I would like to re-ask this question. So they preserve a tradition, but they reshape it for young adults, for what reader? So um, uh, is, is there, do you see this uh, historical background, which also reverberates with, uh, uh, with the oath between uh, God and the chosen people, uh, the punishment of exile, that at this difficult historical moment, they they make this compilation or they come back to, uh, to, to this text. This is the, the first question. The second one is related to it. It is from the perspective of Bialik, the author, as you said, they, they, they also speak to themselves while compiling uh, uh, this book. So we have Bialik as an established writer uh, who is uh, dwelling up with or building up with other colleagues a modern Hebrew literature. Yeah. So he's a writer, he's a witness who went to Kishinev, uh, taking up the prophetic mode. Yeah. And then there's a moment where, if I remember it well, he doesn't write anymore. So yeah. there's a pause and he's dealing with educational things or with uh, cultural activism, we, we could call it. And yeah. now, the anthology comes comes in. How how do you see this as a part of uh, a Bialik project? So making of building up this national poet is this yeah. uh, the work he did with Ravnitsky? Is this kind of making himself a national poet? Um, is is it a part of it? And this brings me to my my third question. So Bialik the poets um, making this 
anthology. And you, in your answers, and it, thanks to the questions, uh, you, you, you beautifully explained that they took out the halachic moments, but they left the midrashic ones or yeah. what is narrative storytelling. Yeah. And as Tobias said, narratives creates us. Narratives creators. So they stress this moment of storytelling. And I was wondering um, whether they also thought uh, of the, fu the future readers, say so they also might be future writers. So they, um, they, they give, they stress this moment of storytelling, which is very vital. And I had the association first of Eddie Wiesel, who retold Hasidic stories in America after the war. And I was wondering in how far Bialik, he also included, though it is written in Hebrew, the tradition of Nachman uh, Praslavsky, who also retold um, biblical story, stories. Uh, and he, his, his mission was, may all of my stories be prayers. So he yeah. also did a kind of heretic, uh, non-canonical text. He created a non-canonical text uh, in, in, in Hebrew and in Yiddish, uh, and infused this into his uh, tradition. So is this also a point of reference to, to Bialik and this wonderful project? Thank you. Okay, thank you for the question. There are big, big, big questions. I don't know if I can answer all of the question, and, but I'll try to make a few points. I really, I don't know if I wish to be at the beginning of the 19th, 20th century in Odessa. The, 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 those were not happy times, but <laughs> and it, it, even from time to time, it was very dangerous. But you can imagine Bialik and Ravnitsky. And I'll tell you another thing. At the first edition, Bialik, Ravnitsky is the, mentioned as the first editor and Bialik the second. From the second edition, Bialik is the first editor and Ravnitsky is the second because in a certain point, Bialik became Bialik, okay? And Ravnitsky stayed Ravnitsky. And at the, Bia, 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 Ravnitsky was the teacher or he found Bialik. But then Bialik became, and you see the background of it. Bialik probably asked to be the first editor and not the second anymore. And they replaced, Ravnitsky done all the hard work and Bialik was like the philosopher of the project or he saw the political power of the project and he wrote all the articles around or all the essays around this project. Ravnitsky was the one who sat at the table and edited story after story after story. Bialik didn't have the time or the willing to do the hard job. He was like looking from above at the whole project. Now, uh, uh, the question of the readers, is a very complicated question because basically, as I said, they wanted to create something modest. At the beginning, they wanted to bring something to school. They wanted to create schools and they wanted to bring something to school and to have readers reading it. Now, eventually what it became, a few years, I'll say that a few years later, uh, uh, a, a, another book was published in America. It's called The Legend of the Jews. And uh, you probably not because you know it. It was written in German. Um, but we don't have the German origin. If anybody finds the German origin, it would be a great discovery. It was uh, uh, translated into e English by Henrietta uh, Sold. And it's a completely different uh, anthology. This is a very open anthology, bringing back more than, or comparing Jewish sources to Roman, Greek, Christian, Indian uh, sources and creating a whole different point of a uh, world of Jewish culture. Jewish culture from the legend of the Jews is a culture that is always in a connection. And in dialogue, I see maybe somebody brought it. And uh, it's always in a connection and in dialogue with other cultures. Bialik and Ravnitsky created a book for readers that tells a completely different story about a book that, or a culture that is not in a dialogue with any other culture. We are not in, a, in any dialogue 
with other culture because they wanted to create some kind of idea of isolated Jewish culture. Now you can think of themselves sitting in Odessa, there are riots all around them, and they're sitting somewhere there, shutting the door, I don't know, locking the door, and continuing working and creating a Jewish culture that has no dialogue with other cultures. And that's their ideal. If I, I don't know if it, it answered your, your, your question, but that's the ideal, their, their ideal reader is a reader that doesn't have or in, is not interested in dialogue with other cultures. Is, they're only interested in the inner cultural dialogue within the boundaries of Jewish culture. As if you can say, this is our culture, these are the boundaries of the Jewish culture, and we don't have any dialogue with any other culture, in, with any other cultures. We are, not, we, can, we are not comparing the stories with stories from, from Greek mythology, from Christian sources. You can, Michal can tell you, you can tell, take a story not only Michal, but you can take a story from the Talmud and compare it to Christian sources. They, 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 because they lived in, at the same environment. And of course, in a way, they knew the same stories. It's, it's, not, it's not always direct dialogue or influence, but the stories were wandering around and people read them. So now for the creation of writers, this it's a great question and they succeed. It, it was a huge success because it's really hard to place Bialik because Bialik grew up in ultra-Orthodox culture and in the Israeli or Hebrew literature imagination, he moved, he became secular. But it's not really true. Bialik never was secular. Bialik lived in between the worlds. He was not a practicing Jew, but he's definitely, I think he would never identify himself as a secular Jew. He was really into Jewish culture. He wrote a commentary on the Mishnah. Very few people know it, but he, he wrote a, a very nice commentary, traditional commentary on Seder al Zayim, on part of the Mishnah. And he sponsored uh, excellent students at certain yeshivot in Hebron and other yeshivot. He gave money to the heads of the yeshiva to sponsor their students. So he was living in between the worlds. Now, Jewish culture or modern Jewish literature wanted to create itself as a new revolutionary culture or literature, we are not connected to our, we are creating something new. It's a European literature. It's something new. We are creating secular new literature. And even scholars of modern Hebrew literature usually doesn't know anything or almost anything about Jewish literature from the medi medieval era or ancient era. There are Modern Hebrew literature is like, it's almost like an island. There's a very, very famous opening line in Moshe Shamir book, Elik came from the sea. Elik bami nayam, he came from the sea. So it's like a whole, uh, I don't know, parable or about Hebrew literature. The Hebrew literature came from this. It doesn't come, it doesn't has, it's not connected or it's not continuing rabbinic literature, medieval literature. So, and now some of the project we are trying to, and if you even look, and I'm sorry again for the long answer, at the structure of departments of Hebrew literature, they are divided. There's rabbinic literature, there's, the guys who do rabbinic literature, I'm the guy who does rabbinic literature. They are the guys who are doing medieval literature, mainly poetry. And those are, those are the scholars who are doing modern Hebrew literature. And the fields are not connected to each other. And when you try to, what we're trying to do now is cross the boundaries and to show the connection between ancient Jewish literature and modern Hebrew literature. And it's not a story of, only a story of rebellion. It's a story of continuing and Bialik wanted to have 
it both ways. He wanted to create a modern national Jewish identity, and he wanted to connect this modern Jewish identity to the past. So he wanted to use the past in order to create modern Jewish identity, but he, he didn't want to lose the past. And he was really afraid that the Talmud, because of its negative image as representing the old Jew, the fragile Jew, the weak Jew, the Jew that is hidden in the Bet Midrash and studying all day instead of working the fields and becoming a man, a real man. It's some kind of a feminized or image of weak Jew. And the, he was really afraid that this kind of image would lose the connection between modern Jewish culture and Talmudic culture. And he wanted to create some kind of a bridge between them, but to use this bridge to recreate rabbinic literature as modern, like if I, you understand what I'm saying. Got a bit lost myself there. I have a little final question by Jan. By Michal. Just to say uh, goodbye to Michal. We, she will come in a few weeks to see her uh, and to hug her directly in prison. <laughs> Looking forward to seeing you all. Thank you, Clive. Bye, Michal. Tudaba. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for your, your lecture. Um, as you mentioned, the, the legend of the Jews, I, I got my copy uh, oh. uh, from the bookshelf. Uh, and it strikes me that um, it's uh, the first edition is in 1909. Yeah. And in the preface, he explicitly says he also uses the, the writings of the church fathers. Yeah. So, so would there be a kind of unspoken uh, criticism of Bialik, uh, Bialik's project uh, there by, by Louis Ginsburg, about whom I don't know anything, to be honest? Uh, yeah, it's, it's a very, very good question. I... Like I really looked and tried to find, you know, the golden line, a yeah. place where they, you know, say something directly on each other, but they wrote it actually at the same time. So it's hard to find anything directly that, but the basic, even if they're not saying something directly or Louis Ginsburg is saying something directly about Sefer Aga, the Book of Legends, these are two completely different perspectives. It's not a, it's not a coincidence or a mistake that Sefer Agada, the Book of Legend, is very popular in Israel, and it was translated in, into English only during the 70s. And the, the, the Legend of the Jews by Louis Ginsburg was translated to Hebrew only during the 70s. It's, it's not a coincidence. They are telling two completely different stories, national stories. The Book of Legend is telling a story of a nation that creates its own identity and is not dependent or in dialogue with other cultures. You read the, the Book of Legend and you, there's no mentioning of any other culture. It's, it's an amazing thing. And even in the essays that Bialik wrote about this book later on, or around the publication of the book, he's talking only within the boundaries of the group, the imagined group. Now, Louis Ginsburg, sitting in the United States, writing in German, of course, the manuscript was in German. <clears throat> he is not interested or he's not aimed to create some kind of a national identity. He's not interested in that. He is interested in how Jewish culture fit or, I don't know, uh, fit within other cultures that Jewish culture was in dialogue with during that time, which means early Christianity, uh, Roman, Roman culture, Greek culture, and other, and he's bringing, I think there are more than 18,000 references in the book to other sources. And, it's almost like Jewish culture is, is melting or into 
the other cultures that it, it was in dialogue with. So you have like a story of Jewish culture is part of a larger project of a larger culture or is always in dialogue with other cultures and Bialik and Ravlitsky did not want it. They wanted to have something completely different and that's why this became a national project and Louis Ginsburg was expelled. His book was expelled from national awareness and it was thriving of course in the United States and other English speaking countries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. It's a very important. Very sorry. I think I overlooked that Ute has wanted to ask a question. Ute, that Ute please. Sorry. No, it's sometimes difficult to see all. Yeah. <laughs> no. Thank you. No problem. Um, thank you, Chaim, for this lecture. I'm very fascinated, and and I'm I'm, I'm so grateful that I can join you, all because I'm totally dilettante in philological studies, Hebrew literature, or Talmud studies. So <laughs> I'm a little bit strange, but um, very fascinated. Um, my question, you mentioned the ideological function um, of this book, or um, I, I understood, uh, Michal, it has a, a kind of ideological canalization. Yeah. Um, and um, it's, it has great popularity. And I heard the message that it shows Jewish culture as it is and, and not as, it, uh, as a process as, um, um, in, in its facets. So my question um, is about the reception of this book and its concept of culture today. Um, um, is there any discourse um, on the, this ideological influence um, of this book and in this ideological um, idea of culture, how it is, uh, or is it kind of sacrosanct, this book, because it is so well known and so popular? Um, so I, I don't know if this is a, it's a stupid question. But. No, it's not a stupid question. All the questions are great, and this is a good, very good question as well. The, in academic circles, yes, there is a di uh, researchers like Tzafi Zeba uh, uh, and other historians are looking into the ideological framework of the Book of Legends. And when it came out, of course, scholars were criticizing it very heavily, very, very heavily. First of all, because they were jealous that they haven't done it and Bialik done it instead. And they were, of course, jealous. And they would say something like, if I would have done it, I would have done it much better, of course, because they are scholars. But they knew that Bialik is not talking to them. He's not interested in them, and he's not talking to them. And they were angry about it. And they find all kinds of mistakes in the book. And they find the, the ideological uh, trajectories of the book. And of course, Bialik was aware of it, and Ravnitsky was aware, and they were aware of it. He said, yes, we meant to make the book like that. It's not a mistake. It's not a mistake that we are de dealing mainly with the Babylonian Talmud and not the Palestinian Talmud, because that's the book that people know, and we are interested in what the people know. Now, today, there are scholars who are looking into the book, but they usually look are looking into the framework of the book, in the... the the ideas that Bialik wrote or the essays that Bialik wrote around the book. What is not have been done yet, and I hope that together with Bian Kanan, that we will have a, a joint project around those topics. I want to read all the stories that uh, Bialik and Ravnitsky brought and to compare them one by one, one by one to the, to, to the, or, the original. And then we'll have, and that's haven't been done yet. Usually people are talking about the ideal, ideology of the stories, the ideology of the whole, the book as a whole. Some of them because they cannot by themselves read the Talmud or not, they are not used to read Talmud. And some of them, they, they think that it's easy because Bialik as a writer, as an editor and as an ideologist is not always saying the truth. Let's say it, or he has different idea of how he perceived the book. He can say we almost haven't touched the stories, but he, have he touched almost every story that he 
he put in the book. So what has to be done now is to take each and every story, compare it with its original in the Talmud and to see the slightest changes that they make, small words that they take out, sentences, half sentences, because they are very sensitive and they are very good readers. And when they read a story and they take something out, they took it for a reason. So the next step is just to compare the whole book with its sources and reread it and to see to what extent really they edited the Talmud and recreate and created eventually a new Talmud. This is a new Talmud. It's a Talmud that never existed before. Here all. <laughs> Thank In my you. introduction, I spoke about liveliness, about storytelling, about humor, and I spoke about students who didn't want to stop. <laughs> I think you know what I meant. <laughs> Thank you very, very much for a Thank you all for wonderful your lecture, morning. for a very morning. special morning. Um, and let's call it the beginning of something. Not the end. Yeah, a wonderful friendship. It's the beginning of a <laughs> wonderful friendship, as they say in one movie. The textuality. <laughs> Thank you very, okay. very much to all of you for your questions and time and for looking into something completely different. Thank you very much. Okay. Bye. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs>